man knows fear of some time, uh, somewhere, some place in their life. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible said, And after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people into the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Now verse 2, you see several things. First of all, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses is a type of the law. They call it the Mosaic Law. So Moses is a type of the law. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Joshua, his name coming from Hebrew, uh, from Hebrew to English is Joshua, but coming from Greek to English is Jesus. So he has the same name as Jesus Christ. So what you have is a picture of here of here is us coming from law to grace. From law to grace. And then he says, Go over this Jordan. There's another Jordan. There's an earthly Jordan, but there's also a great body of water between here and heaven. And the Lord says, Go over this Jordan unto the land that I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now the Lord is telling Joshua, he's giving him his charge. He says, you're going to be my leader. You're going to be like Moses. And you're going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. So he's encouraging him. But he, he says something three times to Joshua because there's a need. Joshua, you know, taking over a great company of people, over a million people. Joshua is becoming the leader, as whereas before he was just, uh, he was just Moses' minister and a general in the army. Now he's going to lead this whole nation of people. And he's scared. He must be scared because God tells him three times not to be. He says, in verse 6, he said, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide an inheritance in the land, uh, divide for an inheritance the land, which I do swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all my law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. What I've read to you from the Word of God is God's charge to a young man named Joshua after the death of Moses. And God is about to take them across the Jordan River into the Promised Land, the land that He had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, on down through there. He's about to take them into that land. Moses tried to take them into the land, but Moses could not do it because of the rebellion of the nation of Israel. The law cannot get you to heaven. Keeping the Ten Commandments cannot get you to heaven. It has, does not have the power. But Jesus Christ can. And compared to Moses who died at 120 years of age, Joshua is a, is a young man according to Exodus 33 and 11. He's a young man, probably around 30 or 40 years old. Exodus 33 11, the Bible said, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend, he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So Joshua is a young man, according, uh, considering that Moses was 120 years old when he died. There must have been some intimidation on the part of Joshua because God charges him three times in nine verses to be strong and very courageous. Now, Joshua had the reason to fear because he would be responsible for leading over a million people into a land 
that he had only seen once, and that was 40 years before. He was going to take them into that land. He's going to lead them against the armies and against giants. He was going to lead a people that weren't sure that they wanted to be led. The Lord reassures him by telling him in verse 5 that he, as he was with Moses, so would he be with Joshua and that he would not fail him or forsake him. Only a promise like that could be a comfort to Joshua's heart because I'm sure Joshua felt exactly the same way that Moses felt in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 15. Moses said over there, he said, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Moses said, God, if you're not going to go with us, I don't want to go. Surely that was Joshua's thinking. God, if you don't go with me, I don't want to go. God tells Joshua in verse 9, Be not afraid. And the only way that he could not be afraid if, is that if God were with him and that he knew that, uh, that God was with him and that if the nation of Israel knew that God was with Joshua. A fellow said one time, he said, there are four great impelling motives that move men to action. Fear, hope, faith, and love. And the greatest of these is fear. Fear is the first in order and the first in force is the first in fruit. Indeed, fear is the beginning of wisdom. That's what the Bible says. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. The scripture summarizes the chief cause of sin and crime. He said, there is no fear of God before their eyes. You want to know what's wrong with this world today, especially America? They have no fear of God. Amen. That's what's wrong with them. If they feared God, this would not be the country that it is today. Right. But they don't fear God. They'll regret that one of these days. Fear the right kind of fear and fearing the right things can be, be a good thing. An older soldier once said to a brash young recruit, and that young recruit said, I'm not afraid to go into battle. And that old soldier looked at him who'd been in many, many battles, and he said to him, he said, only a fool isn't afraid, and he isn't a fool for long. Right. You know, sometimes when I get nervous and... Uh, Things like that. Well, let me say this. First of all, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came about in 1933, and in his inaugural uh, address to the nation, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And when I get nervous sometimes and current problems and uh, the way our country is going and the co crime rate and the shelves being uh, nothing on the shelves and, and Walmart. I went to Walmart here not long ago, and they had sh empty shelves. So what in the world's going on? I've never seen that before. When I get worried about things like that and population, you know, I find myself wishing that we could go back to 90, uh, 1933 when there was nothing to fear but fear itself. <laughs> There's a lot of things to fear. A lot of things to fear. A fellow one time after buying a $50,000 life insurance policy before a plane trip, a traveler, he was just a traveler, and he stepped onto one of those scales, you know, that'll tell you how much you weigh and tell you your fortune. And he got up on that scale uh, while he was waiting for the plane to leave, and the ma machine spit out a card that read, a recent, he had just took a $50,000 life insurance policy. And that little card came out, and he said, a recent investment will pay big dividends. <laughs> That'd kind of scare you, wouldn't it? The man who knows no fear is not only a gross exaggeration, but a biological impossibility. With, the de with disease and children and spouses and life in general, there's always something to fear. There's always things that cause anxiety. And yet with a Christian, there is a remedy. And that remedy is found in Colossians 1.27 where he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us always, and He dwells within us. He goes where we go. He sees what we see. He takes on the problems we take. He sees our anxiety. He sees our fear. He comforts us. As I said, quoted earlier this morning, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 16, He said, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwell in you? He said in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, he said, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, and that if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. God told Joshua in verse 5 that he would be with him and not fail him or forsake him. 
so does the Lord Jesus Christ tell us. He said over there in Hebrews 13, verse 5, He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a promise from God to us. And with His presence, we need not to be afraid. For there in His presence is a peace, and that peace that is a peace that passes all understanding. In John chapter 4, verse 18, He said, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out all fear. Because fear hath torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Psalm 16, verse 11, said, Thou wilt show me the path of life, and his presence is fullness of joy in his right hand, and there's pleasures evermore. When we get our minds right, and our hearts right, and we think right, and realize that Jesus Christ is in control, and nothing happens without him allowing it, that should bring peace in our hearts. The Lord tells his people many times over and over again while he was on the earth be not afraid be not afraid and although there's some things that we're to fear in Christ Jesus we have peace and with his presence felt in our lives we're not to be afraid of things we're not to be afraid of the unknown and I think about the unknown I think what's coming down the line what's coming what's coming I don't know what's coming I certainly wouldn't have guessed what was coming in 2021, but it came. You don't know what's coming down the track. You ought to thank God that you don't know. It drives you insane. Matthew 14, verse 27, he said, But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Here these disciples are out in the boat, and the storm's tossing them and turning, and here comes Jesus walking on the water. And he says, Be not afraid, it is I. They didn't know who it was. They thought it was a ghost or something. And the Lord spoke His Word. That's the thing about it. When the Lord speaks, they're in His peace. You're going to have storms in life. You're going to have things come up in your life that you don't understand. You don't understand. You're going to have disease and trouble and death and jobs and things like that that always bring anxiety and fear. Some folks spend all their time fretting about things they can do nothing about. And that's the wrong thing. That's worry. You shouldn't worry about things you can do nothing about. There's an old saying says, if you have a problem and you can do something about it, then do it and quit worrying about it. And if you can't do anything about it, don't worry. Don't worry. I like that thing. I've told you this before, but I like that thing the French soldier said over there in World War I. He wrote a note to himself. He says, of two things, one is certain. Either you are at the front or you're behind the lines. And if you're at the front... Of two things, one is certain. Either you are exposed to danger or you are, or you are in a safe place. If you are exposed to danger, of two things, one is certain. Either you are wounded or you are not. If you are wounded, of two things, one is certain. You will either recover or you will die. If you recover, there's no need to worry. And if you die, you can't worry. So why worry? That's a pretty good thought. That's a pretty good mentality. That's a pretty good frame of mind. You know, there's nothing you can do if you can't do anything about the thing. Why in the world do we worry about it? But we do. We worry about it. I worry all the time, and I hate to say it, but I do. I worry all the time about what's coming down the line, what's happening in our lives. And, and I worry, you know, what else is going to happen and all this stuff. But that's foolishness. That's foolishness. Trust God. Lean on Him. Depend upon Him. He's going to do right. He's going to do right. Some people fear the unknown. Some people fear the face of man. Some people are afraid of people. Luke 12 verse 4 said, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. That's what Jesus Christ said. Don't be afraid of them that all they can do is kill your body, because there's something worse than that. God can cast you into hell. That's worse than that. The Lord told Jeremiah over there in Jeremiah 180, He said, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of their faces. They get up in your face and they start screaming and yelling. You get in that street preaching thing and you get out there and you go to street preaching. People are hanging out the window and slobbers coming out of their mouth and they've got a look and hatred in their eyes. They're screaming and yelling at you. Don't be afraid of their faces. That's what He told Jeremiah. Some people are afraid of certain preachers. He said, Then spake the Lord to Paul in a night vision. Be 
not afraid to speak and hold not thy peace. I know of a preacher that came up to a friend of mine, another preacher friend of mine, and came up to, and this preacher was known for his uh, loudness and his, uh, his bullying, what he does, he bullies. And he came up to this friend of mine, and he says, uh, he says, uh, why don't you ask me to come preach in your church? And before my friend can say anything, that guy says, I know why you won't have me in your church. You're afraid of me. You're, you, you, you're afraid what I'll preach. My friend didn't say nothing, but I think I would have said, no, I just don't want your kind in my pulpit. And I think I would have told him, you're a bully. The face of man. When you go out to witness, don't be afraid of their faces. Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that, that they go to Galilee, and there shall, I, shall they see me. People cave in to peer pressure. 1 Peter 4, 4 says, wherein they, drink, thought, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They're going to be friends, or they so-called friends, and they're coming up in your life, you young people. Listen to me now. They're going to come up in your life, and they're going to wonder why you don't go out drinking with them, and why you don't do this, and why you don't do that. I'll tell you why you don't do it, because you love Jesus Christ. You don't want no part of it. Don't be afraid of their faces. A survey one time was took of young teenagers, of, of teenagers, and the biggest thing they fear is to be shunned by their peers. Folks, there are some people that ought to shun you. And you ought to be glad they did. You'll be pressed to compromise your convictions by your peers. The Bible said, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. When you're afraid of people, it brings a snare in your life. You, you can't have peace. You can't have joy. You have fear. Don't be afraid of them. It'll contaminate your judgment. You ought to fear the voice of the Lord. You ought to fear it, and then you ought not to fear it. Because the voice of the Lord, there is peace. The Bible said, Matthew 17, verse 7, and Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. When Jesus is around, when Jesus is around, he casts out all fear. He's always saying, Be not afraid, be not afraid, be not afraid. And when the Lord's around us, we should not be afraid. The problem is, some of us, our walk with the Lord is so, so feeble that we don't even realize when he's there and when he's not. You can't sense the presence of the Lord in your life, and no wonder you fear. You ought to have a walk with Jesus Christ, whereas at least you know He's there when you need Him. He gives you the word of instruction. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He said in Psalm 119, 66, He said, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed Thy commandments. It's the voice of the Lord that teaches you, instructs you, guides you, not only does he give you word of instruction, but he also gives you word of warning. Psalm 119 verse 9 said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You know what you'll do if you start reading the Bible? You'll start seeing things in the Bible, and whether you know it or not, it will start making an effect in your life. It will affect the way you live. And it'll start changing the way you are. That's what reading the Bible will do. And you'll see in there some warnings. He says to a young people, he says over there in Ecclesiastes 11.9, he said, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou, for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Enjoy life, young people. Enjoy it. Take advantage of it. Do what you can. But you remember this. That one of these days, God's going to bring you to judgment. You remember that. Enjoy your life. But just remember, you've got God to deal with. God gives us a word of wisdom. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding.
understanding shall attain to wise counsel. The Bible said in Hebrews 4.12, I already quoted this this morning, he said, he said, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and his thoughts, he said, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God already knows what's going on in there before it ever comes out here. God, the Word of God, has already dealt in your heart and in your life. He's there. He knows what your heart really is like. And He gives you the Word of Wisdom. He says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. If you're walking with the Lord like you ought to be walking with the Lord, then the Bible shouldn't scare you. The Bible shouldn't scare you. Then there's the dread of death. We all dread death. But I've learned, learned to look at death in a different way. I'm not saying I've got it figured out or anything, but I, I look at death differently. Uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 36, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. If I could say anything to you about death, it would be this. Just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God always does right. He's going to do right. He will do right by you. He will do right by your family. Death just brings us to the Lord is what death does. It opens the door that we walk through and go in to be with the Lord Jesus. But with Jesus Christ, the grave has no victory. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, He said, These are there are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not, it is, it is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not, it is enough. The grave, there will always be death. As long as we are here upon this earth, there will always be death. Death comes and it comes to every man. The wages of sin is death. So you know it's coming. You know it's coming. But we're so surprised when it does come. We're so shocked. We're so devastated. But it does come. But with the grave, for the Christian, there is no victory. The grave has no victory. He said over there in Colossians 15, verse 55, He said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave! Where is thy victory? You know what's going to happen one of these days? One of these days, that ground's going to pop open, and up they come, boys. Up they come. Boom, 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 boom. Up they come. Death is not it for us. That's not the final word. We shouldn't act like it is. It's graduation day for the saints of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 1, she says... For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hand, eternal in the heavens. One of these days you're going to lay this old body down, you're going to get a new body. And it's an eternal body, it's an immortal body. And we get to be with the Lord and with our loved ones forevermore. That's why it's so important, mamas and daddies, that you make sure your kids hear the gospel and get saved. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing for a man to go to heaven and his children not? I can't think of a more dreadful situation than that. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, He said, For we are confident, I say, willing to be rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Jim and I were just talking about that this morning. Be absent from the body, with present with the Lord. One thing you have, a promise that you have from the Word of God is that when you're absent, when you leave this body, you're going to be present with Jesus Christ. Yeah. That quick. I see my son laying over there. And the angels of heaven come down and picking him up and escorting him right into glory. The Bible said in Psalm 116, verse 15, He said, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. God wants to see us. God wants us to come home. It's a precious thing for us to be 
you'll be with the Lord in His eyes. Then you have the grace of knowledge. You know some things. You know some things as a Christian. You know that death is coming. You know there is a dread of death. Everybody dreads it. But you know that it is coming. Paul said over there in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he said, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You know, as a Christian, that you will be with Christ. That you will be in heaven. That you'll see your loved ones. You'll see the Bible characters that we've read about so many years. You'll see them again. You'll get to see Jesus. Romans 8, verse 38 and 39, He said, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. Nothing can change that. You say, how do you know? The Bible says you can know. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know it. I counted a great dread and fear. A lot of fear comes in people's lives because of things they don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I know this. I know that I'm saved. I know that my wife's saved. I know that my kids are saved. I know that whatever happens, we'll all meet again over on the other side. That's a blessing. That's a joy to my heart. I told my wife just this morning or last night, we'll see him again. We'll go to him. We can't bring him to us, but we'll go to him. We'll see him again. I'll see my mother. I'll see my grandmother and my grandfather. I'll see a lot of people that I've loved through the year. Brother Don Mangus, I'll get to see him again. All these folks. Brother Dr. Ruffman, I'll get to see him again. Be a blessing. Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. I'm talking about Martin Luther back in the 1500s who started the Lutheran movement that broke away from the Catholic Church. And he was coming near death and he's lying on his deathbed and somebody walked up to him. They said, Brother Martin, can you die confident with the faith that you have lived? He said, yes. Yes, I can. And he died. My mama died and I spoke at her funeral. And I said, Mama, my mother died with the faith she lived with. And that's a great blessing. She believed on Jesus Christ as her Savior. She had trusted Him. Because I'd ask her. On her deathbed, I asked her. And she loved Jesus Christ and she loved the Lord. And I said, Mama, do you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior? Do you believe that He died on the cross, was buried, and rose again? I said, Mama, do you believe that with all your heart? She said, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I know that my mother died with the faith she lived with. And so will you if the Lord doesn't come back. God told Joshua, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be very courageous. Be not afraid. Fear comes and fear happens to all. But handled right, fear can be directed to the right things. Fear can be useful. I thank God that I fear the Lord. I thank God that I fear Him and His power. But I also thank God for His grace and mercy and His love for me. And I know that He'll do right. Let's pray. Father, thank You, Lord, for the blessings. Thank You for the time to be here this morning. Of the broken world.